After multiple surgeries for a health scare, Gary Cooper finally thought he could exhale, but all the while, his own wife was keeping a horrifying secret. Gary Cooper was born Frank James Cooper on May 7, 1901. Raised on a ranch in Montana, little Cooper was already on his way to Hollywood. Unbeknownst to him, life on the ranch provided the young boy with a slew of skills that he'd later use in his career, especially horseback riding. However, his mother had other dreams for her two young sons. Cooper's mother Alice wanted her boys raised right, and to her, that meant shipping them across the ocean to England for a proper education. For the rough and tumble Cooper, the stuffy formalities of school never quite suited his freewheeling personality. By 1912, his days of learning English, French, and Latin were over and he returned home. However, not even the security of home could save him from unforeseen tragedy. When he was only 15 years old, Cooper was in a terrible car accident and badly injured his hip. Sadly, his doctor gave him the worst possible advice. He prescribed horseback riding as a method of recuperation. Although the frequent riding was not good for his hip at all, it did give him his signature walk. Throughout his acting career, his tilted riding style and rigid gait became some of his most beloved traits. Now before becoming one of Hollywood's greatest leading men, Cooper had another creative calling, art. Yes, teenage Gary Cooper dreamed of becoming an artist. He was a painter who eventually dropped out of college and began selling his cartoons to newspapers. However, once Cooper moved to LA, two of his friends from Montana introduced him to a new line of work, that of film extras and stuntmen. Within this exciting new network of friends, he also met a rodeo champion named Jay Slim Talbot. Jay would later become Cooper's most loyal stuntman. At the time, however, Jay was his ticket to something greater. He introduced Cooper to a casting director, and as they say, the rest was history. By 1925, Cooper was a full-blown stuntman in the silent pictures, but he wasn't exactly happy about it. You see, stunt work had a dark side, often creating a volatile environment for horses and riders. It was a risky business with injuries running rampant, and Cooper even called the work, quote, tough and cruel, quote. He wanted out, and luckily, he had the perfect escape plan. Cooper's days as a stuntman were coming to a close, and he was more than ready to break into acting. Not only did he pay for a screen test, but he also hired an agent, Nan Collins, who suggested that the actor make a big change. You see, there were already other actors with the name Frank Cooper. To ensure that her new client had a unique moniker, Collins suggested the name Gary, which was the name of her hometown. The name was a golden choice and even Cooper adored it. And on his way up and out, he had no idea just how successful he would be. In 1926, Cooper starred in his first big success, the winning of Barbara Worth, after which critics hailed him as a dynamic new personality. His standout performance finally won him a long-term contract he'd be hoping for, and Paramount Pictures happily scooped him up. With the wheels of success beginning to turn, Cooper had more than just a career to look forward to. One of the key players to help Cooper in his rise to stardom was none other than the beautiful Clara Bow. Thanks in part to her influence, he landed a role in one of the biggest films of 1927, Children of Divorce. But that wasn't all. Behind the scenes, there was a romance brewing. You see, Cooper was quite the ladies' man, and not even Clara could resist his charms. Unfortunately, as heated as their off-screen chemistry was, only one of them survived the move from silent films to talkies. Although Cooper owed much of his initial success to Clara and her it girl influence, it was he who mediated the transition to talkies without a hitch. Sadly, with her grating Brooklyn accent, Clara got left behind. Their romance was swift and short-lived, with Cooper moving on to conquer Hollywood. Cooper really knew how to move from one it girl to the next. In 1929, he embarked on one of his craziest affairs yet. On the set of The Wolf Song, Cooper fell for the alluring Mexican actress Lupe Velez. However, Velez's hot-blooded nature often landed them in some outrageous fights. Emotions were running high at all times, and the tabloids just ate up their antics. During one notable spat, Velez grabbed a knife and began chasing Cooper around. She certainly didn't play lightly, and her anger wasn't just fun and games. Velez aimed to maim, and she eventually hit her mark. She ended up cutting Gary Cooper with the knife so deeply he required stitches. Of course, this was only the beginning. Where Velez used physical assault to hit her lover where it hurt, Cooper did so in his own nefarious ways. 
Gary Cooper was not a man of loyalty and commitment. While entertaining his fiery passion with Velez, he also struck up some affairs on the side, and the women he chose weren't just anybody. He seduced some of the greats, including Marlene Dietrich and Carol Lombard. Now Gary Cooper and Lupe Velez lasted an entire three years before their relationship wore him down. She just didn't fit into his life, and to make matters worse, his mother despised her. When they finally broke up, Cooper was exhausted. However, Velez had one last go at her lover. She'd never backed away from violence in the past, but what she did next was perhaps her most dangerous act of all. The rundown Gary Cooper was just about to board a Los Angeles train when Velez caught up to him. However, this was no tearful goodbye. Allegedly, Velez yelled out a slur towards Gary, pulled out a gun, took aim, and fired at Gary Cooper. Luckily, the bullet missed the actor, and in the wake of the commotion, he ducked into a train car and escaped. Now, later down the road, Cooper shed some light on how and why he stayed with Velez for so long. He wrote, quote, You couldn't help but being attracted to Lupe Velez. She flashed, stormed, and sparked, and on the set, she was apt to throw things if she thought it would do any good. But she objected to being called wild. She said, I am not wild, I am just Lupe, quote. Now Gary Cooper squeezed out a whopping 10 motion pictures in only two years, but it took a heavy toll. After being overworked for so long, his health took a disturbing turn. He dropped 30 pounds and suffered from anemia and jaundice. And then came the depression. His epic rise to stardom wasn't all he thought it would be and left Cooper feeling utterly alone. It was time for a well-deserved break. So in May 1931, Gary Cooper left Hollywood behind, traveling from Algeria to Italy, where he decided to stay. Of course, he had quite the lavish accommodations, shacking up with the Countess Dorothy Di Frasso at her villa in Rome. The Countess became Cooper's mentor in all things European, and her adventurous side led him to some of the most life-changing experiences. While Dorothy introduced Cooper to fine wines and unparalleled gustatory pleasures, she also showed him how to refine his social etiquette, especially among the high and mighty nobles. But Cooper's trip wasn't only about fancy affairs and highbrow visits to Italian art galleries, not at all. Together, Gary and Dorothy traveled to East Africa, traversing Mount Kenya. Cooper went on a hunting safari, and during the spoils of this 10-week excursion, he took down over 60 animals, most notably two lions, antelopes, and a rhinoceros. However, his greatest pleasures lay behind closed doors. You see, the Countess de Frasso wasn't just a good friend, she was also Cooper's lover. Even worse, she was a married woman. Despite this, Dorothy welcomed Gary's romantic advances, and before long, they'd both thrown themselves into a reckless affair. At this time, both the Countess and her husband barely saw one another, and after living such a passionless existence, Cooper's presence in her life was quite exciting, but it was never meant to last. After a year abroad, Cooper returned to what he knew best, acting. This time, however, he was no amateur and he won himself a handsome contract with Paramount. Instead of working himself to the bone, he agreed to make only two films a year. He also attained director and script approval, as well as an impressive $4,000 a week. And suddenly, Cooper found himself back in the saddle. After being so off-kilter for so long, Cooper finally got his life back on track, both professionally and romantically. In 1933, Gary Cooper had a date with Destiny. At a party, he was introduced to the 20-year-old Veronica Balfe. Veronica came from money, but she wasn't like any of his other conquests. She didn't come from Hollywood, and she wasn't married. In fact, to Cooper, she seemed like the perfect candidate for a long-term commitment. After slipping beneath the sheets of countless actresses, Cooper had finally found someone he wanted to put down roots with. Not only that, but Veronica seemed to be his perfect match. They shared the same interests, adoring outdoor activities like skiing and horseback riding. She was also his ticket into New York high society. Being with her opened a whole new world to the ambitious actor, and it was only the beginning. In 1933, Gary and Veronica married in a low-key ceremony away from the prying eyes of the press. Once a wayward rogue, the actor found himself refreshed by his new wife. Even his friends noticed that she sparked a radical shift in his behavior. He took back the reins and turned his back on his wayward past. For the time being, that is. Throughout the 30s, Cooper certainly seemed like the picture-perfect husband. In 1937, he and Veronica welcomed a baby girl. 
Maria Veronica Cooper. Cooper warmed up to fatherhood and became a loving parent. He taught little Maria to ski and bicycle, and soon the entire family could enjoy their outdoorsy adventures together. Cooper's personal life thrived, but during this period, he made a massive professional mistake. Few people know that Gary Cooper was actually the first choice for the role of Rhett Butler in the sweeping epic Gone with the Wind. He certainly had the refined yet rugged looks for the part, but when personally asked to take the part, his response was shocking. Cooper didn't want the part, not even one bit. Convinced that Gone with the Wind would bomb at the box office, Cooper wanted absolutely nothing to do with the production. When the runner-up, Clark Gable, stepped up to the plate, Cooper confidently said, quote, Gone with the Wind is going to be the biggest flop in Hollywood history. I'm glad it'll be Clark Gable who's falling flat on his nose, not me. Quote. As we all know, Cooper's predictions were utterly wrong, and his missed opportunity went on to win Academy Award for Best Picture, among others. Clark Gable certainly got the last laugh in the end. But where one door closes, another opens, and one of Cooper's greatest films was just around the corner. However, it would only invite scandal back into his life. Everything was going swimmingly for the marriage between Gary and Veronica until one infamous actress came between them. When Ingrid Bergman replaced the lead in the 1942 film For Whom the Bell Tolls, Cooper approved. On set, the Gary and Ingrid chemistry was palpable, and their intimate on-screen moments were described as rapturous. But their passions didn't end there. While playing opposite Ingrid, Gary relapsed back into his playboy ways, and before long, they had taken their on-screen romance off-screen. However, this time, he wasn't courting a needy mistress. Ingrid was quite the player herself, and wasn't one to have her heart broken too easily. In fact, when it came to their hot-blooded fling, it was Cooper who came out the worse for wear. Later, he said, quote, No one loved me more than Ingrid, but the day after the filming concluded, I couldn't even get her on the phone. Quote, the player had been played, but that didn't discourage him from completely going off the deep end. Cooper's stint of fidelity was officially over. In 1948, he betrayed his wife when he pursued Patricia Neal during the filming of The Fountainhead. The cheating actor tried his best to keep the affair secret, but in the end, nothing could keep Hollywood from tracking down the truth. The consequences almost tore his family apart. When Gary and Patricia's affair became public knowledge, his wife came to him with her heart on her sleeves. The rumors were awful, but when she confronted her husband, she didn't get the answer she was looking for. Cooper came clean about his infidelity, but wasn't going to give up his mistress anytime soon. Instead of breaking things off, he continued to sleep with Neil. The affair created a rift in Cooper's marriage that seemed too monumental to overcome, and consequently, he and Veronica separated in 1951. For the next two years, Cooper maintained a rocky relationship with his wife and daughter. All the while, the rumors just kept pooling around them. His rumored affairs included Grace Kelly, Giselle Pascal, and Lorraine Chanel. Throughout this time, Veronica still held a flame for her disloyal husband, and in 1953, she welcomed him back into the family home. However, Gary's turbulent personal life wasn't the only distressing thing about him. During the 50s, Gary Cooper struggled with his health, constantly plagued by ulcers and hernias, the actor had to undergo several operations. When he returned to his wife, he decided to turn a new leaf. When Gary Cooper visited the Vatican, he arranged for a private meeting with the Pope himself. Gary wanted to become a Catholic and slew off the sins of his past. He believed that, quote, a little religion wouldn't do him no hurt, quote. But while he always struggled with his romantic life, there was one relationship that stood the test of time. Cooper's relationship went beyond woman. He also had a very close friend in the writer, Ernest Hemingway. This was quite the unusual pairing. You see, Cooper and Hemingway had polarizing personalities. The writer was a total wild card. He was an obnoxious drinker, loud and rearing for a fight. On the other hand, the actor was more reserved and kept his demons locked behind closed doors. He didn't even like to read. Together, this friendship pinpointed an equilibrium that carried them through 20 years of friendship. In 1960, Cooper's health took an incredibly worse turn. Doctors diagnosed him with prostate cancer. By the end of the year, cancer had spread to his lungs and bones. But here's the weird part. Cooper had no idea that all hope was lost. When the doctors informed his wife, Veronica, of his condition, she decided to keep it a secret from him. And while Cooper battled cancer, his friend Hemingway faced his own mental tribulations. 
They managed to hike through the snow together one last time before Cooper discovered that he was indeed on death's door. A couple of months later, the beloved actor made one last announcement to the public, and his words were devastating but heartwarming. On May 4th, 1961, Cooper expressed, quote, I know that what is happening is God's will. I am not afraid of the future. Quote, Nine days later, he closed his eyes forever, and in a tragic twist of fate, his close friend, Ernest Hemingway, didn't last much longer. He took his own life less than two months after Cooper passed. Now what did you find most interesting about Gary Cooper's life? Was it his marriage and family life, his lifelong playboy actions, or even his near-death experience with his ex-girlfriend? Let us know down in the comments below, and if you're interested in more Hollywood scandals and stories, make sure to subscribe to the Factonate YouTube channel.